Good morning, Lionheart. Let's get this day started off right. So I'll give you a little heads up. In two days, we have an extra special vlog. I almost completely forgot we were even doing this, but I had saved it in my calendar many months ago, and it's finally here. So in two days, we're gonna do something that is ultra special to me, and I hope to most of you as well. Well, what are we doing today? I'm not exactly sure. I have it narrowed down to about three things, and it kind of depends on whether he's going to Pollyanna's or not, which I know he wants to do. So as soon as I hear back on that, gonna make a final decision well gang I figured out what we're gonna do I decided on the one of three things and we're actually gonna do something extra while we're there because I had looked this up when I came back from Portugal um, and I could only find one one Portuguese bakery or anything like that food place out here and it's kind of far away but it's pretty much out there where we're gonna be today anyway so maybe we'll check that out so let's head out of here So one of the places that we're going today is actually a famous grave. And uh, I know I've mentioned in the past that I used to have a People magazine when I was a teenager that had a lot of like famous graves in it and that kind of got me interested in wanting to see some of them. And this one was actually, this person was actually in that magazine, however, their grave has been moved since then, so I'll tell you why when we get here. Well, if you remember when I was in Portugal a couple of weeks ago, I had something at Pastas de Belém called Pastas de Nada. Well, this is called Nada's Pastries, and this is one of the only places in Los Angeles that you can get Portuguese bakery type goods, so I wanna go in and check it out. I have no idea what they have here, but like I said, I looked it up, and the, there's literally two locations in Los Angeles, and this is one of them, so I figured we're up here, let's go in and relive some of Portugal. And that actually reminds me of the business card for my friends in Sintra. Oh yeah, this is legit. Look, they have Francesina on here. Oh yeah, everything looks good. I don't know what I'm gonna get. And they do have a uh, nice assortment of the pastas de nada. See, there they are. We've had where they were actually originated, so we'll try them here and see how they are. And I think I'm going to get the Franchesina today just because I loved it so much in Portugal. I don't know when I'll be back here, so I might as well get that and uh, compare it. It's so great to look at all the pictures on the wall because I can look at all these and go, I was there, I rode those, I've been on that. Isn't that great? It's the fun and exploring. Oh. Remember we went, uh, we had to go back there twice. Yes, well I know for sure I'll have food to take home. I know that for sure. Um, I'm hope, what I want to do is have one of these now before I eat my uh, Francesina and take one home and then take, you know, my Francesina home whatever I don't finish. It was kind of funny when I walked in, I grabbed the menu and started looking and within probably one minute I saw the Francesina and I was like, okay, I know what I'm getting. I went up and ordered and she said, wow, that was quick, are you, are you Brazilian or are you Portuguese? How do you? And I said, no, I was just there a couple of weeks ago, so I'm, you know, missing the food, and I wanted to compare your stuff to the stuff that I just had. So she's uh, pretty excited for me to try it. All right, let's go for one of these guys first. Oh, it's excellent, absolutely excellent. Oh yeah, if you want the Portuguese experience, at least for these so far, you can get it here. Yeah, it tastes exactly the same, and you can see that beautiful custard inside there. It's not exactly custard. I wouldn't know how to describe it, but it's really great. So the plan is, after we eat, we're going to head down the road, and we're actually going to go to where Karen Carpenter, the amazing singer and drummer, is now buried. All right, my food has arrived. That thing is huge. I mean, look how big that is. They used a, uh, a thicker bread than what I had when I was in, um, when I was in Sintra. But uh, I'm excited to try it. They served, I mean, that's the way they served it in Portugal too. They always serve it with fries, so let's go for it. The thing I'm most curious about with this sandwich is comparing the sauce because I couldn't put um, my finger on what the flavor of the sauce was, but it was just amazing. So if I have that same experience with this where I can't quite des describe it, they probably nailed it. Well, it is very good. I've had it twice before, so if I had to rank it, this one's a little spicier than the other ones, but I would say this is probably the second best one I've had, with the first best one being um, 
at a place I didn't show you guys, but this is really good. So you guys know I'm not a uh, I'm not a beer drinker, but traditionally in Portugal they were telling me that you always would um, have a beer with this meal because they use beer in the making of the sandwich. All right, well that's what I'm taking home. I'm taking home probably more than half of it, but I did end up finishing both both of the pastries, so we'll call it even. Well, I would definitely give them a uh, two thumbs up for authenticity. Definitely come out here if you're around. Well, out here is the final resting place of Karen Carpenter and her parents now. Now, originally she wasn't buried here, like I mentioned, but in 2003, her brother Richard and one of the primary producers of the Carpenters decided to move her and the family here so that when he and his family passed away, they would be able to uh, all be buried together. And that seems extremely fitting because the Carpenters were an extremely close family. I mean, they started out in Connecticut, New Haven. They saw that Richard had an amazing talent for creating music and they knew that it would be very hard for him to be discovered in Connecticut so their father took a trip out here looked around and thought the family might like it now Karen originally was really into sports and she was kind of a tomboy she loved baseball but once Richard became really good at music she f got the bug and fell in love with music as well and she became <laughs> originally she became the drummer and various projects that Richard was putting together, but then they realized that she really had a great voice. She and Richard went and cut a demo when she was only 16 years old and he was 19, and they were so good that the person that cut the demo called members of the Wrecking Crew and said, you gotta produce these guys, they're amazing. Um, this was when she was 16 years old. They even participated in a battle of the bands at the age of uh, 16 years old when, uh, well, Karen was 16, um, Richard was 19, and they won the Battle of the Bands at the Hollywood Bowl. Now, one of the crazy things is that one of the Battle of the Bands that they won was host, well, it was one of the judges was John Wayne, and John Wayne was so taken by this 16-year-old Karen that it was right before he was getting ready to make um, True Grit, and he actually went to the studio and said that they needed to try this girl out. This was the girl for the movie. So they did do a screen test with her, and uh, unfortunately she didn't get the part, but you could tell from a very early age that she had a tremendous ability. Now if you go back and you watch, you can look up, um, I think it's Dancing in the Streets that they're covering. Um, Karen's only 17 years old and she is a phenomenal drummer. I mean a phenomenal drummer. She took lessons at uh, Wallach's Music City, I believe. Um, she used to buy her stuff at the drum shop over there on, uh, on Vine Street and so she was a really accomplished drummer, but it was her voice that stood out. Now most of us know that unfortunately her untimely demise at the age of 32 was brought on because of um, heart failure or heart attack brought on by um, anorexia. Now that kind of came from her, her high school days. She said she was kind of pudgy when she was younger and if anybody mentioned it that just stuck with her and even I guess one time her mother said maybe you uh, just keep in mind that the camera adds you know some weight when you're on TV and things like that and it just got in her head plus they said once she did her very first tour um, and she came back from that tour she was even more self-conscious than she'd ever been so that kind of led to it plus I think that you know the Carpenters were a very family unit um, and that's what made it work. Most of their career, they all lived in the same house, even when they were adults. Their, uh, their parents, for a long time, managed their money. Um, and their mother, Agnes, who's entombed here, um, she really ran the family. And 
One of Richard's first girlfriends even said that when they started dating, she was actually one of the costumers for their tour. And she said that her and Richard started dating and they couldn't go on a date without Karen accompanying him. And she was an adult, but they just, you know, she said, you know, Karen didn't want to let go of Richard. She didn't want that to move on. And throughout her life, she would sparsely get to date. She never, I mean, she was married, but she never really had that lasting relationship that would bring her any kind of happiness. Um, now, one of the things about the Carpenters that's absolutely admirable is that, you know, they both found um, love in performing. They loved every bit of it. They loved their fans. They loved, you know, so much so that they didn't really have a life outside of it for a long, long time. Um, their entire life was, if they weren't recording, they were doing promo stuff. If they weren't doing promo stuff, they were on tour. If they weren't on tour, they were writing music or figuring out, picking songs, what they were going to do next. And I mean, I think we all know, like, um, Superstars, one of their classics. And they had so many hits with um, doing Burt Bacharach's music that they ended up getting a deal with a and Records and they made a lot of records in a short amount of time. Now they did so many records in such a short amount of time that Richard kind of had almost a breakdown and he basically at one point had to check himself into a, uh, a hospital to relax and that was pretty much the end of the Carpenters. They never really um, performed or anything together after that. That also forced Karen to start a solo career and she hooked up with Phil Ramone to work on a solo record uh, because Richard um, had done a lot of the producing and so a lot of people said you know that was what gave the sweetness and the charm and everything to the music but Karen thought that maybe it was time for a change for her maybe a different you know she wanted to get a little bit different kind of music out there maybe a little bit more rock and so her and Phil started working and Phil said that it was you know she was in such bad health at that point that you could just you know if you hugged her he said you felt like if you gave her one extra squeeze you'd break her in half and it was during those sessions when she was staying with him in New York um, that he would come out one day and find her passed out on the floor um, she had started taking um, diuretics. She had been taking uh, laxatives and with somebody who is as small as she was, she had gotten down to the point where she was like under a hundred pounds all the time and uh, her body just couldn't handle any kind of medications or pills and she was a consummate exerciser. She was terrified. They said that was like her big fear was gaining any kind of weight or feeling like she had gained weight. She was even watching a television show one time where it was her and Olivia Newton-John and someone else and she kept looking at Olivia Newton-John saying, oh God, look how big I am compared to her and just, you know, it was all in her mind. But unfortunately she just, you know, sometimes the demons latch hold pretty hard and you can't get rid of them. And I think in this case, that's really what happened. She, um, you know, that fleeting comet burning through the sky that was her was only meant to be here for a short amount of time and left an amazing amount of work and beautiful songs behind. I don't know if that's open or not. I'm guessing probably not, but... Now, she was a big fan of Disney, so you can see that Mickey Mouse is sitting in there. That was her Mickey Mouse, and they do have this completely gated up, but Karen's, um, her resting spot is right up here on top. I'm having trouble, um, shading it out, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna try so you can see. There, it says, uh, Karen Carpenter... A star on earth, a star in heaven is what the uh, underneath it says. Now I do commend Richard for moving her and the family because I had, like I said, I had grown up with the People magazine that had a lot of um, famous musicians um, burial sites and it had hers in there and it was just such a small little, such a small little headstone that now there's something that really is worthy of, of her and it's really nice to see this. 
Now I, uh, I have vlogged her, the house that they lived in before, and like I mentioned, they all lived together and in fact built a, uh, well had a, bought the house property next door and that became like the, the music space where the, the carpenters would practice and everything. But um, I believe I heard now that one of the houses has been torn down and um, when Richard sold that house, the main house they lived in, he, uh, he actually sold it furnished. He sold it with everything in it. So you can find a video on YouTube of uh, the owners now um, kind of letting people do a walkthrough and you can see a lot of the carpenter's stuff inside there. And what's pretty sad is that the people that bought the house and lived there weren't carpenter's fans. I don't even believe they were from this country in one of the articles I read. So when people would come by that were fans, they would just give them things, but they had so many people showing up um, and knocking on their door and kind of disturbing them that they quit doing that. But there we are, the final resting place of Karen Carpenter. She would be right on top right here. And it is a very nice cemetery that she's buried at now. She wasn't too far from this one, I think just a few miles, but the reason that they, uh, they moved here was it's closer to where Richard lives. Rest in peace, Karen Carpenter. Well, leave it to me to show up the day they're having some sort of uh, military funeral. I had no idea when I was driving in I was going to get in the way. In 1983, when Karen passed away, she was living back at home with her parents and uh, was found laying on her closet floor. What's really sad is that for a long time she just didn't want to eat because she didn't want to gain any weight and then it got to a point where she just couldn't eat anymore, just did not eat. They said she would just move food around on a plate and never eat any of it. Well, I just came home and had an Amazon package here, and I didn't order anything, so I'm guessing that Jaw got something. Usually when there's something from Amazon, it's for the Jawster. Oh yeah, it's food for Jaw. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jennifer Robertson, and you ask if I have a P.O. box. We don't have a P.O. box, I'm sorry. For anybody that was asking, what are you whimpering about? You're the, you know it's for you, so you're crying? You're freaking out? Well, I figure since this vlog was on Karen Carpenter, we might as well go over to Dearly Departed because um, Scott Michaels has her the sink from her bathroom, and I figured, why not show it? I mean, you're watching a vlog on her life and her death, so let's go take a look. Well, here we are, Dearly Departed Tours and Artifact Museum. It's one of the great things about being friends with somebody who owns a museum like this is that we can come in and add this to the vlog. And the other reason I wanted to come by here was because many of you may know that they do some of the best death tours in town and every February 3rd they do a Karen Carpenter tour so you can go see you know where she lived, where she's buried, all that stuff if you're interested and you're in the area. I mean it's definitely I think one of the better tours you could probably ever take because Scott is somebody who if he dedicates an entire tour to someone or something, it's a topic that he knows inside and out and can do an absolutely fantastic job. So let's go take a look at the, uh, the sink that he has in here from her, her room. Well, this is new. He's got uh, flowers from the grave. Jerry Marin, who just recently passed in. Jean Jean, I saw one over here of the one and only Hugh Hefner. One available, it says. There it is. Wow, just to think how many times she would have brushed her teeth or put on makeup or who knows what in that sink. Or would have just been standing over it singing. Think of it as toothpaste. Yeah. Now Karen's drum set is on display at a um, 
at like a cultural center or like a performing arts center in Long Beach, but I've never been able to get in to see it. However, what I'm gonna take us to see now is the drum shop where she used to buy her drums and things like that. Um, it's not too far from here actually, and it's where all the pro drummers of the time bought their stuff. The Wrecking Crew guys, I mean pretty much every Ringo Starr and Karen Carpenter. So let's go take a look. Well, Karen was a phenomenal drummer. I think anybody that watches her performing would see that, and I personally have always felt because of a lot of the interviews that I've I've seen that moving her from behind the drums to kind of like a front woman, I feel like that made things worse for her. I think that was a lot of attention to have placed on her, even beyond being the voice. But this is where she would have uh, bought her drums and it's pretty cool because not only did she, you know, play great drums, but she didn't mess up either. I found interviews with uh, couple of the studio musicians that played with them and they said you know when she when you played with them in concert or for recording she didn't miss a beat now normally on the recordings they hired Hal Blaine who was part of the wrecking crew and he was also one that hung out here um, to play on the records but she always played live I don't know why that is I, I never some of the early demos and the early recordings they made um, I do know that she um, she played drums on those, but once A&M signed him, she didn't get to play drums on those anymore. And it was, you know, pretty sad that her last uh, her last attempt with that solo record that she um, she was making with Phil Ramone when they finished that and they played it for A&M Records, they just said it was too different than what she was known for, so they refused to release it. I'm sure that had to have been a pretty rough blow in the end. When I was inside Dearly Departed, one of the people that does the tours there was uh, talking to me about Karen Carpenter a little bit because he said he has a friend that used to uh, used to be a dancer and was um, on tour with the Carpenters and said that Karen and Richard always spent a lot of time together and that kind of goes in with what I was saying, how close of a family unit they were and how I feel like, you know, in a lot of ways she truly would have been happiest if uh, if the whole family had always remained in the same house. Yeah, he said when they were out on tour or playing Vegas or anything, they didn't really go out and party or or do much. They really stayed to themselves and worked on music, music, music. Well, on our way back, I stopped off at the uh, the Goodwill just out of curiosity and found this for 99 cents. How cool is that? It's actually good quality too. I'm just gonna have to wash it about 8,000 times just to be sure. Well, we're out and about taking our buddy to the park. A little early evening park visit. Well, the normal way that we usually go in is locked up, so this must be the only way in now. There's your hero, folks. He's kind of looking gassed out, isn't he? Gotta find something by three in the morning 